So I was thinking uh, about language and communication a lot. It seems to be um, something that's happening in our culture. There seems to be a general breakdown in communication and even more so in communication and understanding and understanding each other. And um, it seems to be, it's like um, a cultural virus is the way I was thinking about it. Like our culture has caught a virus and it's not allowing us to hear each other. And um, so that was where the idea of, of the virus came into the title. And um, to preface that, which I guess I should have started with, um, the color blue has always been associated with me. Um, first off, I have blue eyes, but primarily because my mother had four boys in two years, two and a half years, so she color-coded us, and I was blue. <laughs> <laughs> my twin brother was red, and my older brother was yellow, and my little brother was green. So uh, I even have little Star Wars figures, and the, their feet are colored blue. Where she took a sharpie and made sure that we knew exactly who Star Wars figures were who, because that was a very important thing to know when you were eight in the seventies. Um, so blue is something that's gone along with all of my shows in some way. Um, this is my thirteenth big show since I got out of graduate school, so it was interesting to think about that number as well, and like how much kind of time and work and growth and confusion has gone into those ensuing 18 years um, since I left Tulane. And, and, and thinking about that and how I tried to communicate what I'm thinking about art and what I'm thinking about our culture and more than anything what I'm thinking about what it is to be human, which is what I make our art about. And it's what I think we all make art about. Um, on some level. So I tried to take four ideas, kind of language from an intellectual point of view and language from a, from a historical point of view and language from a hurtful point of view and then language from a humorous point of view. So I tried to divide it up into four things. Did I know that's what I was doing when I started working on the show? No, but that's how it that's how it evolved, and that's how I began to understand the work as I was making it. Um, there's a lot of artists in this room, and I think most people are artists. Um, and you probably understand how that happens when you're making work. And you're trying to figure out what is this stuff that's coming out of me, and how am I, how am I expressing, am I making any sense at all? You know, because sometimes you don't know. Because I work, most of my work gets made in a barn in my backyard, and, Everything makes sense back there, but like when you get onto the gallery wall, it doesn't make sense. So this piece, one in three gnomes, or um, uh, Ein und drei Gartenstag, to put it in German, is, um, is talking to the idea of conceptual art and talking to kind of my newfound love of conceptual art. And an artist in 1965 who took, um, very famously, a photograph of a chair and the dictionary definition of a chair and a chair, and put them by the wall and said one in three chairs. So this is the most derivative piece I've ever made in my life. But I really wanted to do the same thing, but with the with garden side or a no. Um, some of you may know I make gnomes, can't help myself. And so here we have one in three gnomes. And the idea behind it is an intellectual idea. When I say gnome, everyone in here has a different picture in their head of what a gnome is. Um, so words mean very different things to every one of us. When I say shirt, you think of the shirt you wore yesterday or the first shirt you ever owned. So I have a different idea of what a shirt is than you do. We have different pictures. And that's where communication breakdown starts. Like we all have different pictures for every word. So getting to where we can actually understand each other at all is amazing. 
considering we all have different ideas of what things are and different, different visions of what those things are. So that's what this piece is about, exploring the idea of how we see things, not only differently, but how we really see things differently, because we learn the words in different situations. Um, this piece uh, is called On the Origin of Barnacles, and it's, uh, that title was uh, from a book written about Charles Darwin. Um, when Charles Darwin came up with his theories of evolution, he actually kind of perfected them and tried them out studying barnacles on the coast in Cornwall, not in the Galapagos Islands. He went to the Galapagos Islands and got really good examples and wrote his books, but he really perfected these ideas looking at barnacles, and I've always been really interested in kind of crusty, organic things. So to me, the origins of language when you look at early pictographs and early um, marks that became language, they're very organic. They look like things from nature, and a lot of times they represented actual things. They were drawing a picture of a horse to represent a horse. Um, and pictures that were trying to not be a beautiful picture, but they were trying to convey as much information as possible. They were merely, merely utilitarian, because they were trying to get meaning across. That was it. And that's where language started for us, written language. And um, I've been making these off and on for years <clears throat> and just went through the last four months a huge burst of making um, a few more. And because I wanted to see what they look like as actual text, if I could get big enough so that they look like text, they look like something from an ancient book or a wall. Um, and how communication started with pictures and eventually became language. And again, where, where communication goes wrong. How do those pictures, how are they different and how do we interpret, we, how do we interpret the pictures different based on our experience and what we bring to the experience? Um, I was also, these are all made out of clay that I've collected that's reclaimed throwaway clay from a lot of classes that I've taught and experiences that I've had with clay. And for me, it was important to use kind of clay that had already been talked to by a bunch of people. So it had been sitting in rooms and listening to us. And so I thought it was interesting to use that clay to make these. And there's lots of bits of my garden and rocks and sticks and vermiculite and um, old broken glass all mixed in with them. So it's this idea of taking, taking things around and putting them back into a new thing, making a new thing with them. So how language evolved. And also, I, I, think, they're, I think they're pretty. Like, I think there's something about them that's quite um, beautiful. And so I like pretty shiny things. So, um, and then um, this piece over here, so I finished this piece um, three days after the show was open. I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> and because uh, I tend to do things like that sometimes. Um, but I wanted to make something about how language tears, how language hurts. Like I really, there's the point is that we can really damage each other and like, you can damage things to the point that they don't recover with language. And Marcius, Marcius was a satyr that challenged Apollo to a duel. He said, I can, I can sing as well as you can. And Apollo said, like, hell, you can. <laughs> and if, if, if you can sing better than I do, you can become a god. And if I can sing better than you, I'm going to flay you alive. And of course, Apollo was a god, so he sang better than him and he flayed him alive. And there's a painting by Titian, who's, uh, if I had to say a favorite painter, I would say it was Titian, um, where he paints the flaying of Marcius, and he paints himself as three satyrs in the painting, an old man, a young man, and a baby. And so he's watching this Marcius get killed, um, 
and the child's not understanding what's happening, and the young man's bringing water to help, and the old man is just watching. Just like, this is what happens. And uh, so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about language, and how language got Marcius into this problem to begin with. <clears throat> and how can speaking truth to power, or speaking, as I put it in this um, poem, speaking out of turn to power can get you in trouble. And it's something that I think a lot of artists and a lot of people struggle with, is um, speaking truth to power. And how do you do that? And when do you choose to do it? Um, and, and how far do you have to push before they either fire you or they end you or whatever they do to you to make you stop? And um, so it's about language and, um, and also about endings. And that's, that's what I'm going to, I'm going to end with that on that one. And the last piece, I feel like I'm rambling today. I hope that I'm not. Um, I know that I'm supposed to be rambling on some level. Um, in the hallway, which is called the Hall of Punishments, which I apologize for that, but I do love a good pun. And I wanted to talk about humor and language and how um, we can hurt with it, but we can also heal with it. And part of that is humor. And um, having our sarcastic disposition helps you get through the damage we can do with language, I think. So uh, <clears throat> please enjoy those pieces. There's um, some interesting ones. I hope you find some of them funny. And um, that's, that's basically what I tried to do with this show, was talk about language and communication, and maybe try to get to the point where I was thinking about language more carefully and the, the words that I said to people, and to try harder to understand the words that people say to me, and maybe not always take them um, take them for what they meant were meant instead of based on how much coffee I've had or how tired I am. Because that has a lot to do with how we take things that are said to us. Um, thank you for your time.